Also, for people in the back or on the sides, there's a lot of seats um, inside the room also still, if you want to fill it in. Hi, everyone. Um, so we're, we're getting pretty full. So for those of you who are coming in, if, you've got a, if you're sitting down, you've got an empty chair next to you, you've got some space, put your hand up and help some people find a, a space to sit just for now. So folks in the back, there's space up here, a couple spaces right there. Now can you hear me? OK. So there's some space up here. I see a couple spots right there, some brown chairs. So if you're looking for a spot, um, make note of the hands. Thank you. Two minutes. There is a row of seats available up here in the front row. You'll have a really good view. All right, we're about to get started here. There's, again, for those who are just arriving, there's some front row seats here. Oh, and there's a whole middle section that's wide open. Is the webinar, is the Zoom going? Yeah. All right, well, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for your time tonight. Uh, we hope we have a good lineup for you. My name is Julia Nordyke. I'm the Water Quality Outreach Specialist for the University of Wisconsin Sea Grant. 
Uh, the University of Wisconsin Sea Grant is based at UW Madison, but we have outreach uh, extension specialists that are based at our different universities. Um, and uh, the mission of Sea Grant is to uh, the sustainable use of the Great Lakes uh, through re research, education, and outreach. And so uh, my colleague Adam Beckley has organized this event. He's a uh, Wisconsin um, Sea Grant uh, coastal engineer. Okay, so some logistics for the meeting and the agenda. Uh, we have a lineup of experts uh, to, on the topic of Great Lakes water levels and what we're gonna see coming up here uh, for the Bay. Um, and so we have folks from the Army Corps of Engineers, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, the National Weather Service will be talking. Uh, Wisconsin Sea Grant will be speaking also, and then we'll wrap it up with the Department of Natural Resources um, folks. And so, let's see. This meeting is going to be recorded and then will be posted on uh, University of Wisconsin Sea Grant's YouTube page following. So if anyone wants to refer back to it, it's also being live streamed. And if you didn't get a chance um, to sign in, there is a sign in sheet. So if you want to put your email down, then we can contact you uh, with updates or other information related to this to this meeting. So I'm just going to start passing this around if you didn't get your name on a sign up sheet. All right, the restroom is located behind me, basically. So you go out, you go straight towards that glass, take a short right and then a left, and the restrooms are down that hallway. I hope that's correct. I'm not really actually familiar. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> um, and then I would also just, um, one thing we'll send out by email, but uh, Brown County Emergency Management has what's called Code Red. And it's for to receive notifications for extreme weather events and like and lakeshore flooding and other flooding events. Uh, you can go to their website and sign up for text messages alert system and they're highly recommending that people do sign up for this system. Uh, so uh, to be in contact and aware of those events. All right. Oops. Sorry. All right, so first up, we're going to hear from the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and I believe D. Apps. Oh, sorry, it's going to be Chris Warren, followed by D. Apps, and then uh, followed by Crystal Walker. And we will take questions at the end of everybody's presentation. At the end of the entire at the end of the entire series of presentations. We won't get through everyone. Okay. So my name is Chris Warren. I'm a senior hydraulic engineer with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Detroit. One of our key missions there is forecasting the water levels of the Great Lakes. So I'm going to walk through a little bit of background on the hydrology of the Great Lakes. And then my colleagues, D. Apps and Crystal Walker, will follow up with a little more information about what we've seen, what we expect to see, and then what we can do about it. So I know I just told you I'm an engineer, and I put up a bunch of text. I see a few faces and haven't heard a groan yet, but we'll walk through some basic information just to get everybody up to speed with some of the ways we talk about the Great Lakes. First, when we're talking about the water levels, we're talking about an elevation above sea level, not a depth. We also refer to Lake Michigan and Huron as one lake. We'll call it Lake Michigan Huron. And that's because they're connected at the Straits of Mackinac. They rise and fall as one lake. The water levels we refer to are lake-wide means or averages. So that, whether that's daily or monthly, it's based on that network around the lake. And it also is what we call a still water level. So it's not impacted by wind, other meteorological events, storms, those kinds of things. The Detroit District Corps of Engineers is the official keeper of water level information for about the last 100 years. The period of record is from 1918 to 2018. And the reason it's only 2018 is because we coordinate with our counterparts in environmental, Environment and Climate Change Canada because they're international water bodies. I will pause and actually read the slide on this last bullet point because this is one of the key things to keep in mind that the primary drivers of water level fluctuations are changing weather patterns and the resulting fluctuations in water supply. 
So the Great Lakes is a huge interconnected system. And because it's a system, you can f actually follow the water as it flows into Lake Superior, out of Lake Superior, through the St. Mary's River, into Lake Michigan Huron, then through the St. Clair, Clair River, the Detroit River, and into Lake Erie. There it spills over Niagara Falls, into Lake Ontario, and then eventually to the Atlantic Ocean via the St. Lawrence River. One thing I will point out is that there are two points where the outflow of the lakes is regulated. Here at the Sioux Locks, and then also again at the outflow of Lake Ontario on the St. Lawrence River. Just because it's regulated, however, doesn't mean we have control over the water levels of the Great Lakes. Yeah. Also, because it's a system, the high water levels we've seen in this past year are a Great Lakes wide event. So what we have here, so just some images of the impacts to personal property, to infrastructure that are seen all over the Great Lakes. Everything from the top left there near Duluth, South Haven, Michigan, on the other side of Lake Michigan, Lake Erie, uh, Oswego, New York on Lake Ontario. Now th those are significant impacts, you know, everything from walkways to roads to people's homes, uh, other infrastructure. Uh, that, that's happening all over the Great Lakes this year. So I mentioned that it's the changing weather patterns that drive the changes in water levels. So what, what does that actually mean? Uh, we, we track a quantity called net basin supply. And what that is is simply the amount of precipitation the lake gets added, the amount of runoff from the land, and then we subtract the amount of evaporation. Those three components really capture the effects of the weather. And that's what we talk about with changing water supplies. You'll, you'll note that we've got those three pieces, evaporation, precipitation, and runoff circled whereas the inflow from an upstream lake or outflow are not necessarily a portion of that. So what does that mean? Well, uh, we'll start with a nice little cartoon here. Uh, so wintertime, you know, most of the precipitation in the Great Lakes tends to accumulate as snow. So you wind up having you know, water sitting in the basin waiting for that springtime runoff with rains and the warmer temperatures. So then you increase the runoff to the lakes. With spring turning into summer, you have longer days, warmer days, more direct sunshine, though it actually increases the temperature of the water. If you've gone swimming, you know, in the Great Lakes, you know, say July, it doesn't necessarily feel warm, but it does actually represent, you know, increased energy within the system. That sets up the fall where you have cooler, dry air going over to the Great Lakes, causing an increase in evaporation. What that translates to here with this red line is actually the seasonal rise and decline of one of the lakes. This is Lake Michigan, it's specific. You know, January, February, March, kind of a steady, slowly changing water level. You know, and then in the spring, the water level rises with that increased runoff. And then in the summer and fall with the increased evaporation and decreasing runoff, you wind up with a seasonal decline in the lakes. So that's kind of the Great Lakes Basin Hydrology 101. Um, I'm going to have, hand it over to my colleague, Dee Apps, who's our lead forecaster for the Great Lakes. And she'll talk about what we've seen and what we expect to see. All right. Thanks, Chris. So to, <clears throat> to move on, excuse me, from here, we're now going to talk about, as Chris mentioned, our period of record of monthly mean water levels that goes back to 1918. So what you're seeing in this graphic is uh, the monthly mean water levels is the blue line. And that red line is the long-term average annual level. And we, we show five hydrographs here, uh, Lake Superior at the top, Lake Michigan Huron is that second graphic, and then Lake St. Clair, Erie, and Ontario. And I know the numbers are probably hard to see in the back, but what these graphic is really trying to show here is that um, in, in, in what we can see from our period of record is that water levels go through periods of high and low water. Um, the last time Lake Michigan Huron was at a high water period was in the mid 80s. Um, and then I, specifically, I want to point out here in the late 90s, we actually transitioned to a low water period. And we were in this period of low water until about the beginning of 2013. Actually, the lowest monthly mean level for Lake Michigan Huron is January 2013. However, beginning in 2013, to through 2014, we really saw a record-setting two-year rise uh, that brought water levels out of this low water period uh, to back above the long-term average annual level. And since then, since about 2015, we've annually just seen a steadily rising lake level, which culminated in record highs in 2019. 
uh, which are highlighted here by the green circles. You can see there are green circles for Lake Superior, St. Clair, Erie, and Ontario. They all reached record highs in 2019. Lake Michigan Huron did not set a monthly mean record in 2019, although it came very close. It came within an inch in multiple months, but it did not actually set a record. This slide is just going over what those records were in 2019. So the records began in May for Lake Superior, St. Clair, and Erie. Lake Ontario jumped in there in June and July and set records in those months. And then in August and September, Lake Superior, St. Clair and Erie either tied or set new records for those months. Um, the last three months, October through December, we did not see a monthly mean record set, uh, but we were very close. As you can see within one inch on Lake Superior in October and just this past, past month in December within one inch on Lake Michigan here. So your next question will be like, okay, well, how did we get here? How did we really go from low water to high water? And what we've really seen is a very persistent wet pattern in the Great Lakes Basin. And what you're seeing in this graphic is precipitation ranks for the Great Lakes Basin. And what we've seen is we've seen the wettest 12 month, 24 month, 48 and 60 month uh, periods in the Great Lakes Basin uh, based on 120 plus years of record. So that's your wettest year on record, wettest two years, wettest four, wettest five years um, on record for the Great Lakes Basin. Now, if we look at conditions that have been more recent, this is uh, fall precipitation. So the first graphic on the left is September precipitation. The middle one is October. The, the far right one is November. And really what's showing here is the green and blue areas are showing precipitation above average. The yellows and reds are denoting precipitation below average. Um, you can see that in, you know, northeast Wisconsin, northern Michigan, really in September and October, we saw um, very much precipitation above average. It's those ranging about 175 to 200% of average precipitation in those two months. November, that far right graphic um, that is showing, that was a little bit drier, but still near average precipitation roughly during November. So even though, um, you know, that, that month was a little bit dry, overall as a whole, the fall was pretty wet. Following up now with just the recent December basin conditions again. So now um, this is that first graphic there on the left is the same diagram from the last slide, but it's just showing December precipitation. Again, December precipitation being above average in those green and blue areas for northern Wisconsin and Michigan. That middle graphic is showing temperature anomalies. Um, orange and reds denoting temperatures above normal. Um, so as you know, toward the end of December, as you probably many of you remember, it was pretty warm. Uh, we saw a significant amount of, of runoff from snow melt, but also what that warmer temperatures do is it led to decreased evaporation during the month. As Chris had mentioned before, during this time of year when the lake levels are declining, evaporation is one of the main components of water supply to the lake um, that affects the lake level. This is when you know, we're losing that evaporation. And it's really due to the evaporation occurs because of cold air moving over warm, the warm surface water. Well, when you have warmer air, you have moving over now these surfaces that you, you don't induce as much evaporation. So that's what we saw in December. That last graphic on the right is showing stream flows, which is really an indication of how much runoff we're likely to see in the basin. Um, and what you can see here is in that Northeast Wisconsin and Northern Michigan, where you see those dark blues and black coloring, that's an indication of stream flows much above normal and high. So we're also seeing a decent amount of runoff in this past month. So now I'm going to transition, now that we kind of went over, okay, where, how have we, you know, got to where we are now, now we're going to look ahead. And so these are forecasts that are put together by the Climate Prediction Center. Um, these are one month outlooks on the top for temperature and precipitation. So that's for the month of January. The bottom is a three month outlook. That's for January, February, and March. And so in the temperature graphics that you can see, the blue coloring denotes a likelihood of an area experiencing below normal temperatures. 
the orange area is a likelihood of an area of experiencing above normal temperatures. You can see in the one month outlook there on the top that the Great Lakes Basin is in a white area, which means the when they put together this forecast, it's equal chances. They're not sh really unsure if it's going to be a likelihood of above or below. And you can see that same indication in the precipitation graphic where the Great Lakes Basin is also um, in, the, in the white area. For the precipitation graphic, what you're looking at that green area would mean a likelihood of above normal precipitation. Now, when we move down to the three month outlooks, you can see that, that, that the, those conditions change. Now, in the Great Lakes Basin, we're expected to see below normal temperatures. And then and for precipitation, we're expected to see above normal precipitation. So now in these, by you know, late winter, early spring, there's a likelihood that we're going to see wetter conditions again. So we're seeing in the climate outlooks that we're looking at, we're seeing this continuation of a wetter period. So now I'm gonna talk about our six month water level forecast. And this is a forecast that we produce at the beginning of every month. It goes out six months. Um, we have a bulletin product that this is something we coordinate with Environment and Climate Change Canada. Um, the bulletin product looks a little bit different than this. I'm not sure if some of you get the, that product. Um, I'm showing you another graphic that is also available on our webpage, but it has a little bit more information on it. So I'm gonna walk through what all of these components are. So you can see that the red line and blue lines there say next to 2020 and 2019. Those are the daily lake-wide average water levels for the given year. You can see the blue line extends from January through December. That red line might be a little bit hard to see, especially if you're in the back. It's just because in January we haven't had many, in 2020 we haven't had many days yet. So the line is fairly short. Um, those pink dots there in the middle are the long-term average monthly mean levels. And then those black dashes at the top and bottom are representative of the record highs and lows for that given month. <coughs> Excuse me. So one quick note that I want to make about the record high and lows. As Chris pointed out in the beginning, right now our coordinated, our coordinated period of record goes from 1918 to 2018. We have not coordinated 2019 data yet. Um, so as I'm showing you this, I know I mentioned that we had, we had records in 2019, but because they're not coordinated yet, they're not reflected as those higher black dashes on the graphics yet. So you can probably see like, for example, Lake Superior, you can see in 2019, especially like May and June when it set records that 2019 daily level is above those dashed lines. Um, and that's just because we haven't, we don't have those 2019 data on our plots yet because it is not officially coordinated. So just want to make that point. Um, so now let's get into the actual forecast. So the forecast on this graphic is the green dot. Um, that's what we consider our most probable forecast. And then you'll see that there are red bars extending from that green dot. And you can see them more noticeably around the six month time frame where there's a little bit more uncertainty. That's what we consider our 90% range. So as we're walking through this, you see the meters values are on the left, the feet values are on the right there. Um, so the main point here, I'll, and I'll talk about Lake Superior first and then I'll move down to Lake Michigan here on. Um, we are starting 2020 above 2019 as so far in, um, in January. Uh, Lake Superior is forecasted to tie its record high in January and then be near record highs throughout the next six months. On Lake Michigan here on, we are starting 2020 well above 2019. Um, Lake Michigan Huron is still in its seasonal decline. We do expect it to decline into about February or March. It'll probably decline another couple inches or so before it begins its seasonal rise. However, we are projecting record high water levels for the next six months for Lake Michigan Huron. All of those green dots are above those monthly mean maximum levels for the next six months. And then lastly, this is the same graphic, but for Lake St. Clair, Erie, and Ontario. Uh, for the sake of time, uh, I'm just going to say again that all of these lakes as well are starting 2020 higher than 2019. 
and all three of them are also forecasted to be near record highs really over the next six months. If we do see those wetter than normal conditions uh, that appear likely at this moment, we could see potentially more records in 2020. So this last product I wanna bring up is, is called what we call the water level outlook. And this is an outlook that goes out 12 months. Uh, we call it an outlook um, because it's, it's not really a forecast, it's basically a scenario-based tool. And it allows us to answer the questions, what if? And um, I'm gonna bring up just, I'm gonna focus in on this, when we talk about this product, I'm just gonna talk about uh, Lake Michigan Huron um, so we, you can see the graphic better. Um, so what this does, oh, well, first let me go through, this is a very similar graphic uh, as to what you just saw. So those black dots in the middle are your long-term average monthly means. Those dashes at the top and bottom represent the monthly highs and lows. The black line there that's following here and over here, that's the last two years of monthly mean water levels. And then you'll get into that forecast range for the next 12 months. So that orange band is the six month forecast, which we just went over in the last graphics. Now I'm gonna explain to you what that gray bar is, that gray range that you're seeing in that graphic. And what you're seeing there is, is this is how we see it. Given where we are now, it's kind of showing you the range of possible outcomes. So how do we get that? And what we do is we have, as Chris mentioned and pointed out, net basin supply is your precipitation plus runoff minus evaporation. We have net basin supply data that goes back to 1900. So we have over 100 years of net basin supply sequences. And what we do is say, giving, given our starting water level, if we, if we route all those water supply sequences through our routing model to get water levels, what water levels would we see, given where we are starting from right now? So given the historic net basin supply scenarios that we have, that range, that gray range represents the potential of potential water levels we could see. And what I want to point out is that even under the driest scenarios that we have in our historical record, Lake Michigan Huron stays well above its average. You know, the average being these black dots. So, you know, even if we see dry conditions over the next 12 months, we'll still be at water levels well above average. Now, the next thing I wanna talk about here is those three colored lines. So you have a green line, a blue line and a purple line. The green line represents the 2019 water supply. So what that green line shows you is if we have water supply that's similar to last year, that's which is toward the highest part of this band, those are the water levels we could potentially see. Those blue and purple are representative of 1996 and 2017. Those are also two other years where we saw very high water supply to the lake. So it just gives you another idea. So if we, if we do see these wetter water supply scenarios occur, we will be well above records in 2020. Last thing, I just wanna bring up a couple resources. So this Living on the Coast, which I believe the Wisconsin Sea Grant provided here, which is great. This is a great resource for, um, <clears throat> for property owners on you know, how to protect your shoreline. Um, it's also available on our webpage as well. Um, so that is another good, good resource. Um, for the Great Lakes and out of our office, we have put together a high water webpage um, that you can access here. And um, that's a great, great place to go to get water level information. And this is Chris and mine's contact information. Um, I also have business cards too. Um, you know, you always welcome to call or email us as well. And so now I'm actually going to pass it to Crystal. She's going to talk a little bit about um, emergency management from the core. All right. Good evening. Um, my name is Crystal Walker. I'm with emergency management for Detroit Dis District with Core of Engineers. Um, so the reason I'm speaking with you today is. Um, 
In addition to our forecasting mission that we have within Detroit District, we also have an emergency management mission. It is one of the key missions of the Army Corps of Engineers. And our Emergency Operations Center is activated for this event. We have been providing support to communities for high lake levels since we started seeing those records broken in May. So seven months in, eight months in, um, and so there's been a lot of lessons learned and we've been spending a lot of time in, time in your communities. So we wanted to uh, just bring to your attention that right now we are providing what's known as technical assistance under emergency response authorities for five counties in Wisconsin. So Brown County is one of those counties. Um, that's what uh, has us here today. Um, and then an additional eight counties in Michigan. So don't feel like you're alone. This is a widespread event across multiple lakes, multiple states. Our sister districts are also providing support. Um, and what that, what that technical assistance typically entails is oftentimes sandbagging technique training. Um, there is a proper way to fill and place sandbags so we can go into communities and uh, let you guys know about that, let your emergency managers know about that. Um, and also, once you have them filled, where do you place them? If we have limited resources, how do we deal with our most critical public infrastructure? Um, how do we uh, make the use of those limited resources, make sure we're not wasting anything and planning ahead for the future? So that technical assistance that I mentioned, um, it is one of the types of authorities that we have. And really what it entails is our ability to provide a community with knowledge and data that can help uh, try to solve your unique challenges during an event. So I listed some examples here of what could, that could mean. Um, we have dedicated flood fight teams that are trained in how to um, deal with rising waters and not only deal with them, but to teach you how to deal with them um, by giving those trainings that I mentioned. Uh, we have a huge catalog of data and modeling that we do as part of our, our normal everyday work that we can uh, give your counties access to if it helps to solve your particular challenges. Um, and then we also, we have an entire section in our research and development arm that does nothing but ice. You know, we're tracking ice jams and providing mitigation measures in partnership with your emergency management programs. So all of this is provided at no cost um, to the city, the county, or the state. It is all Army Corps of Engineers funding. So this is what currently Brown County is approved to receive from us. We've been working with them extensively um, at this point, doing a lot of uh, site visits and really getting to know the unique challenges in your communities. So for example, all of these pictures are from 2019. Uh, starting in the top left, we have seen communities experience feet rises in water. How do you flood fight that? That is a very unique challenge in an urban environment that um, has really uh, led to some unique solutions. Uh, in the top right, we've helped a lot of communities actually set up sandbagging staging efforts. So places that you, the community, can come to and fill your own sandbags, learn how to sandbag, et cetera. Um, in the, uh, the bottom left, we're having huge issues with public infrastructure. What if your fire hydrants are under two feet of water? That becomes a life safety issue. How do we make sure that we get that, that capability back within your communities? And then the, the bottom right, um, if you have water on your streets and your streets become impassable, again, a life safety issue. We need to have uh, ambulances that can get to your communities, to your home. So how do we make sure that those are maintained for community safety? So all of these are things we can address plus more. So these are just some examples from this year. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of address one of our frequently asked questions. Um, under emergency response authorities, the Army Corps of Engineers cannot address erosion. It is a very clearly stated limit to our authority um, and is really unfortunately a non-starter for us to provide assistance. So um, this is emergency response authorities only. We do have a lot of other programs in the Corps, um, our regulatory programs and some of our other uh, new work programs can address it, but under emergency response, there is no capability within the Army Corps of Engineers. So if you have emergency management questions, um, 
we are a federal agency. We are supplemental to efforts that are taken at the city, county, and state levels. So anytime, um, you're welcome to call us. Our contact information is listed here. But don't be surprised if we um, recommend that you talk to your city and talk to your county. There's a lot of um, processes in the, um, the declaration workflows that they need to know what's going on in your community so that they can keep that documentation and keep that awareness um, to make sure you're getting the resources you need. So first and foremost, we always recommend that you reach out to your local emergency management authority. Um, and we also have a bunch of information on that Great Lakes High Water page that uh, Dee mentioned just a minute ago. So uh, there's POC information, their uh, point of contact information, there's sandbagging videos, all kinds of great resources there. And then, as I mentioned, our uh, contact information is here. Um, I also do GIS. If you have pictures or GIS data, um, you know, send it through the proper channels, and we'd love to see that, you know, and see what's really going on in your communities. Um, so with that, I believe that's the last for the Army Corps. Okay. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, up next, we have Mike Saletti. He's from the National Weather Service in the Green Bay area. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mike Saletti. I'm a meteorologist and the Marine Program Leader at the National Weather Service in Green Bay. I've been a meteorologist here for about uh, 12 years now and in the Weather Service as a whole for 15 years. So this evening I'm going to talk about uh, what we learned in terms of lakeshore flooding across northeast Wisconsin over this past year. We all know it's been a very wet year, and we saw that in that last presentation. Uh, just how wet has it been? In 2019, Green Bay received 48.63 inches of precipitation on the year, and making it the wettest year on record. And this broke the previous record, which was set in the previous year in 2018, when we saw 39.21 inches of precipitation. Now we typically average, uh, over a course of a year, about a little over 29 inches. So over the past two years, we've seen about three years worth of precipitation. And it really hasn't just been wet these past two years, six since 2013, six out of the last seven years, we have seen above normal precipitation. This is actually part of a much longer trend dating back to the late 1890s. Uh, over the last 120 years or so, we've seen a gradual increase in precipitation. And that rate is about a quarter of an inch per uh, decade of increase. Another factor that has not necessarily led to uh, rising water levels on the Great Lakes, but it kind of prevented them from falling, has been ice cover. Ice cover reduces evaporation, like we saw in the last presentation, and can prevent water levels from falling. So over the last four years, we have seen above normal ice coverage on the Great Lakes. Um, you can see the very uh, high uh, amount of ice on uh, the Great Lakes in the 1970s, the late 1980s. But we start in the trend of being colder again in the winter and uh, we've seen above normal ice coverage again on the Great Lakes. And that extends into Lake Michigan as well. Over the last six years, we've seen an average ice cover little over 52 percent um, and the average is about 40 percent. Now all that precipitation has led to record or near record uh, water levels on the Great Lakes and one of the main impacts that we've seen uh, over the past year has been an increased threat of lakeshore flooding. When we're trying to examine the potential for lakeshore flooding at our office uh, we need to consider a couple components. Uh, first the storm surge uh, that usually involves uh, strong cyclones passing across the area, low pressure systems. Uh, the storm surge is generally defined as water levels above and beyond its daily water level. Um, and then we also need to consider waves on top of that. So waves tend to occur on top of a, st a storm surge. We have four gauges in northeast Wisconsin that measure water levels, two on the bay and two on the lake. 
We have uh, one off the shore of Menominee, another one on just off sh the shore of Sturgeon Bay Canal, one offshore of Kiwani, and then we also have one at the mouth of the Fox River, just offshore of Green Bay. Unfortunately, we don't have any buoys or gauges that can measure wave heights on the bay. And so we have to estimate those using computer, computer models. So in a very good study, um, comprehensive thorough study done by Melby in October of 2012, they documented the top 20 storm surges that have occurred at various water level gauges on Lakes Michigan and also Lake St. Clair. And at that chart that you see up there is the top 20 storm surges at five of those water level locations, those five uh, gauges. And Green Bay is denoted by those green circles at the, at, at, towards the top, and I'll highlight those for you now. So you can see that the top 20 storm surges at Green Bay are, tends, tend to be at the, towards the top of the chart. And they are typically higher than many other water level gauges uh, uh, that we've seen on Northern Lake Michigan. And I can highlight those for you there. So uh, those other water level gauges that are shown on that plot include Kiwani, Sturgeon Bay, Port Inland, which is on the very north shore of Lake Michigan, uh, right on the shore of the Upper Peninsula, and also Mackinac City. So you can see from that plot there that um, Green Bay, the Bay of Green Bay, and specifically the, the mouth of the Fox River is one of the most susceptible, if not the most susceptible, to storm surge of anywhere on Lake Michigan. Now the storm surge threat may be lower on Lake Michigan, but they tend to see, tend to see much larger waves on Lake Michigan. Uh, so they're more prone to erosion type uh, of a threat. Whereas we're at the Weather Service, we're, we're very concerned about the storm uh, surge threat going in uh, over the next several years. That study also documented uh, the, the frequency of, of storm surges or what months do they typically occur. So that study found that the top 20 storm surges in Green Bay tend to occur in spring and fall when we have passage of very strong uh, storms, cyclone activity through across the region. Uh, they tend not to occur in winter and that's because of the ice cover that's typically present on the bay. We don't also, we don't see as much uh, storm surge in, in during the summer months as well. The highest on average tends to occur in December. The, the, the highest storm surges tend to occur in December right before the bay tends to freeze over. Uh, we see the, the most frequent cases occur in April or just about right after the bay melts, the ice on the bay melts. Uh, I look back at a lot of the observations during these top 20 cases in Green Bay and many of them involve northeast gales for a, a, a certain amount of time. Uh, generally, they range from about three to 10 or 11 hours in, in duration. A lot of the other cases involve northeast winds for a very long time, anywhere from 24 to 48 hours. And some of them had both of those conditions met. Now the study by Melby documented the top 20 storm surges at Green Bay, and they generally range from about two and a half feet to as high as over five feet in height. The largest one, if my memory serves me correctly, occurred on December 3rd of 1990. Uh, during that event, the storm surge reach was measured at the gauge at about 5.41 feet. Now we've seen at our office, we start to get reports of flooding um, on Northwest, over Northwest Brown County, like in Swamico area, when the water levels at the Green Bay gauge, mouth of the Fox River, reaches about 582.6 to about 583 feet. That's only about 1 to 1.4 feet above the current Lake Michigan water level, somewhere in that range. Um, and over the course of 2019, we had about eight episodes of lakeshore flooding uh, across northeast Wisconsin. And those top storm surges of this past year generally range from about 1.25 to 2.41 feet in height. The top one occurred on de December 1st, and that's the plot that you see there, uh, right there. Um, and that water level at, on December 1st reached just under about 584 feet. Now, one of the things that surprised us over the course of the summer is which shoreline of 
the bay and the lake was most affected. Wh which shoreline got the most reports of flooding? And it turns out that of all the shorelines over northeast Wisconsin, the western shoreline of Green Bay from around Marinette down into the mouth of the Fox River got the most reports of flooding. It seems to be they're the most vulnerable areas to flooding across northeast Wisconsin from the bay or the lake. Many areas over northwest Brown and southern Ocano counties have homes, structures, and roads that go up right up next to the immediate shoreline. And once water levels get to somewhere in that range of 582.6 to 583 feet, we start to hear reports trickle in of some flooding occurring on some of those uh, roads and, and possibly even leading to um, road closures and evacuations. Now, we mentioned that the top cases of storm surges tend to occur in spring and fall, but that doesn't mean that lakeshore flooding is not possible, particularly during the summer months. There's something called a meteor tsunami, and that is a phenomenon of which it, it, it creates large waves um, that are typically generated by strong to severe thunderstorms or squall lines. Uh, they occur during the summer months when thunderstorm activity is at its peak, and it can bring free flooding to the area. Um, they generally last on the order of minutes to a few hours. And we had two of those cases this past summer. Uh, we had one on, uh, on August 7th and another on July 24th. And the one that I plotted here, this is the plot of the water level gauge at the mouth of the Fox River right there. And that's the gauge that measured a really good media, uh, media tsunami that occurred on July 24th. That was the bigger of the two. Um, what happened was that we had severe thunderstorms move across the central bay and towards the tip of the Door Peninsula. And outflow from those thunderstorms was out of the northeast. Uh, I think it got up to about 35 knots or about 40 miles per hour. And it pushed a really large wave down the bay, all the way down to the bay, into the mouth of the Fox. And it created uh, flooding on the Fox and the East River. And I think there was a report of even a dock becoming loose on, on the Fox River. Uh, during that event. But you can see how quickly that water level rose there and then fell just as fast thereafter as the water went back out into the bay. All right. So whenever we're concerned about lakeshore flooding, we're uh, around the mouth of the Fox River, southern Brown, uh, northern Brown County, we're also concerned about flooding on the Fox River itself and also on the East Rivers. Whenever we see rising water levels on the bay, that also typically leads to rising water levels on the Fox and the East Rivers, especially during Northeast winds. And that's when waters tend to back up on the Fox, back up on the East River, and then we get flooding uh, around, the, the, around the city. So what I showed here is from that same storm of December 1st, uh, the blue line is the water level gauge at the mouth of the Fox River, on, right on the bay. And the orange line is the water level gauge, the USGS gauge on the Fox River, about a half mile uh, upstream on the river. So there's about a half mile difference uh, between the two water level gauges. Uh, one's just a little upstream on the Fox, the other's right on the bay. And we can see here during this event that the water levels on the two gauges, one on the river, one on the bay, follow very closely. They kind of mimic each other. So this is very fairly typical of what we see uh, when we're monitoring the potential for flooding. When uh, the water goes up on the bay, it typically goes up on uh, the Fox River as well. So we have a variety of headlines that we can issue to alert the public and our partners that there's potential for lakeshore flooding. We can issue a lakeshore flood watch. Is, that's when we, uh, when we think significant lakeshore flooding or erosion is possible in the next 12 to 48 hours or so. When we think the flooding may be just more of a more minor variety, more of a nuisance, um, we issue a lakeshore flood advisory, and that's typically in, in 12 to 24 hours into the future. But when we think flooding is or erosion is more of a serious threat, and uh, particularly to life and property, we issue a lakeshore flood warning, usually within 12 to, to 24 hours of the event. And most of the time we're issuing those headlines when we're expecting strong and gusty northeast winds. 
But what kind of surprised us over the last 12 months or so was that we also were getting flooding with strong east and southeast winds. And that's particularly on the western side of the bay, uh, particularly around Oconto, Little Suamico, Suamico area. Um, even southeast winds can lead to flooding uh, along that part of the shoreline. So some impacts that we've seen from the high water levels. Uh, we've seen shoreline flooding to roads, parking lots, and parks. Uh, usually those are right on the immediate shoreline of the bay. We've seen submerged docks and piers to, around boat launches and marinas. We've seen flooding near the mouths of rivers, particularly the Fox and the Acanto River. We've seen damage to structures near the shore, uh, increased debris of marinas, we've heard about that. And we've also seen a significant amount of erosion take place. Here are some of the images that we've gathered at our office from various news agencies and social media um, across Northeast Wisconsin. Um, some of you may have seen these already, but this is fairly typical of what we've, uh, we've seen um, over the last, I don't know, nine months or so, starting last spring. So we saw this, uh, these diagrams in the, the, the forecast in the last presentation. Uh, we're expecting a below normal, better than average chance of below normal temperatures uh, over the next three months. If that were to occur, maybe we get some real good ice buildup on the bay and that would kind of delay any kind of lakeshore flooding aspect, mitigate that somewhat through that peak, secondary peak period that we see in April. Uh, but unfortunately, they, they are, Climate Prediction Center is forecasting a better than ever's chance of above normal rainfall, and that's gonna lead it that lakeshore flooding continue to be a problem, uh, at least through uh, next summer and probably into the next fall when the next peak comes towards the end of the next year. That's all I have for you guys uh, this evening. Uh, if you have any additional questions, uh, you can uh, see my email address there, uh, email any questions you have or Maybe you can have some questions that you can uh, ask me at the end of all these presentations. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Thank you Mike. Okay, our next presenter is Adam Beckley with the University of Wisconsin Sea Grant Institute. Thanks, Julia. So before I get going, just to get a sense of who's in the room and what hazards you may be facing, let's get a Show of hands first for the folks standing in the back. If you need a place to sit, anyone who has a open seat next to them, please raise your hand. Um, folks in the back, if you need to sit down, please find a hand and, and grab a seat. Um, so show of hands, who here is from Brown County? Okay, what I expected. Anyone from Door County? Okay, a couple folks. Kiwani County, anyone make it? Okay. Um, what am I missing? Manitowoc County. I saw Paul from Manitowoc. Um, anyone further from there? Anyone I missed? Okay. Sheboygan? Menominee. Okay. Further up the bay. All right. Let me start my slideshow. So that gives a sense of uh, different geography that people are seeing. Some are low lying, some may, people may be up on bluffs. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about different types of coastal hazards. Uh, and what's, what's behind them, some adaptation options, and then share some educational resources. Um, and if you grab some on the way in, I'll be covering those. So talking about erosion, what are the factors that cause erosion? So this, this figure shows there's a lot of different things that are behind erosion. And things that we're talking about now uh, happen from the water up. So our water levels and our waves um, sort of attacking the shoreline. But that's not 100% of the picture. We can also have issues coming from the top of the land. So this is showing, this is showing relatively high bluffs. Um, this could be uh, applicable for, for a shorter bank, five feet. Um, stormwater runoff from the top of where your house is down the slope can also uh, create a significant amount of erosion that's a little bit you know, hard to see. It's just constantly ongoing. Um, groundwater seepage through these slopes can also remove water as the groundwater is flowing out, it takes soil particles with it. So those are things that kind of happen all the time that we got to keep in check as well. Uh, certainly the waves and water levels, the natural process uh, is doing a lot of work on the shoreline right now. So 
Um, just a little cartoon. Uh, you probably see it when there's a storm, but I'm just going to explain. Um, this maybe is a, is a house. If you're a little higher than that, picture a little higher. If your house is a little lower than that, um, picture a little lower. But at low water periods, when we have a big storm come in, storm surge raises the water level, as Mike said. We have waves on top of that. And you had 100, 200 feet of exposed lake bed or beach, you probably didn't notice too much when a storm like we saw in December came in. Now, when we're at record high water levels, that same storm that could have occurred in 2013 when you had that beautiful lake bed and beach and uh, probably some Frank Mighty's growing, um, that same storm comes in and now those waves are able to hit the base of your property, start taking away material and eroding. Um, so the storms aren't just all, also much worse. Uh, we're noticing them now much more because the water levels are high. So those are sort of the natural processes of erosion, but it's, it's a lot easier for us to increase erosion and slow it down. So what are some of the things that maybe we do uh, on our properties that might be contributing to erosion? Well, um, one is as we change the near shore dynamics, we put in hard structures. That changes how the waves interact and can cause increased erosion at our neighboring properties that maybe don't have protection. Um, we put in impervious surfaces, roofs, uh, driveways that can cause runoff to increase. And sometimes we like to get a view of the lake, we cut down the vegetation. The vegetation is good at holding soil. So um, those are other human alterations that can affect erosion as well. So just wanted to set the stage of sort of all the things that can be affecting a property. Um, and we can't just, I mean, certainly wave erosion is causing a lot of work now, but we don't want to only focus on that. Um, sometimes the majority of the erosion at some properties is actually caused by some of these upland issues. So in terms of protecting coastal investments, I like to, to say a top-down approach. Um, starting at the top. And so what you can do at the top, you can manage your land use, manage water, manage vegetation. So we go down to the water, still managing water, vegetation, and how, that, how the slope, the stability of that slope is important. And then once we get to the water, if, if those sorts of practices aren't cutting it and your house is still um, in risk, then we think about reducing the wave impact, adding shore protection if necessary. And so this is, this is a, a graphic I made because there's, it shows a bluff. There's lots of space to draw on. Um, but a lot of these are, are still applicable if your property looks more like this. So don't think I'm excluding you, uh, Brown County, all the hands where you don't really have that high bluff. Um, this just lets me show a lot more things. So first thing at the top, without picking up a shovel, uh, you can do from your living room is thinking about flood insurance. And we have Michelle Staff from Wisconsin D&I who's going to talk more about the details. Um, but you don't need to be in the floodplain to buy flood insurance. Most of your homeowner policies aren't covering flood flooding. And compared to, say, 2013, when water levels were low, we're at much higher risk for flooding right now. And so the risk is higher, but the cost of flood insurance doesn't necessarily reflect that change in risk. So in terms of a value proposition, flood insurance is a much better deal now because it's not going to take much of a storm to cause flooding. So um, think about that as maybe a first step as flooding is a concern um, because that can give you some peace of mind. Um, I'm sure Michelle will cover this, but Wisconsin DNR, do I need flood insurance? Is a great resource if this is something uh, that, that sounds interesting to you. So again, that's, that's sort of managing from the top of the bluff, top of the shoreline from your, from your kitchen um, without you know, having any, anything done to your property. So when we think about our exposure to hazards like erosion and flooding, uh, the first thing to think about is, how is our, what's our land use? Particularly, where is something valuable like our house relative to the hazard, like eroding front of your bank or bluff? And so oftentimes I like to explain this in terms of geo time. So your house is X distance from erosion. And if you know how fast the erosion is happening, um, the time you have left till that erosion arrives at your door is that distance divided by how fast it's happening. And so um, if your house is already in, in place, you know, your geotime is there. If you're building a new house, I would say build as much geotime as you can. Um, but 
something you can do that, that people may think is, is a huge undertaking, and it is, is building relocation. If you have space, uh, you can move your house back to a safe distance and, and buy yourself geotime. So this is a picture of a, a house in Sheboygan County in 2007. They were pretty darn close to the edge of their bluff, and, and it was eroding quite rapidly. They moved it back. They owned this, this property back to the barn, um, picked up the house and moved it back. It was much more economical to do that than to try and fight the erosion with uh, constructed measures like riprap and things like that. They had to have new foundation, new utilities. It wasn't trivial, but it was the most effective option for them, cheapest option, and it bought them a lifetime of not having to worry about the erosion anymore. So think about if you have space to move your building, getting your property, your house out of harm's way. Another thing to do at the top is managing water. So um, water flowing down the slopes can cause a significant amount of erosion. This is a house where the downspouts are pointed directly towards the edge of the bluff, which is concentrating water and having it flow right down the bluff. And so uh, the advice to them I gave was, well, either kind of route those downspouts back to the front of the house or put in a rain barrel where you can catch the water and release it in a useful way, could water your plants, things like that. Minimizing impervious surfaces, that reduces the amount of runoff that you have. So if you're thinking of putting in a new concrete patio, maybe use something like a pervious brick paver. Um, if groundwater is an issue, if you notice water flowing out of the side of your, your slope or bank, um, you can, inter if it's moving, removing material, uh, you can sort of drain that groundwater out and, and cut that problem out. Um, intercepting perched ground, groundwater is what it's called, something like a French drain or a wick drain or things that are thrown around, um, mainly getting that water out of the slope and down, uh, piping it down to the, to the lake. And then one thing that uh, you may not think of, uh, a lot of houses on the lake have septic, um, and this is, uh, I think in Sheboygan County, the mound system septic tank was put right on the edge of the bluff, which did two things. It added a bunch of water to the, to the bluff every time the toilet got flushed, and it added a bunch of weight to the edge of the bluff, pushing it down, making it more prone to collapse. So they ended up moving it to the front of the house, which maybe from an aesthetic standpoint, you don't want it up there, but from a, not having your house fall in the lake, uh, go with that option. So um, some of these may not work in every situation, but thinking about is water an issue? Is it, is I, do I see erosion uh, come from water flowing off my roof? And what can I do about it? Maintain and enhance existing vegetation. Um, plants, trees, shrubs, uh, grasses, they, those roots provide a lot of um, strength to your soil. The roots hold the soil, as well as the plants taking water out of the ground and transpiring it up into the air. So um, a lot of times people want to see the lake and uh, maybe come in and cut down the vegetation, um, but that vegetation is doing really good work whether you have a high bluff or, or a low slope. So some of the things that are recommended, uh, deep rooted vegetation and native vegetation, turf grass, that maybe four inches of, of root depth, it's really not holding a whole lot of soil. Um, something uh, with a lot more root depth uh, would be more advisable. If you have a nice lawn and you wanna maintain it, uh, one thing you could do is a no mow buffer. So you leave 10, 20 feet closest to the edge of your slope, edge of the shoreline, let that grow out, maybe put some native vegetation in there, but just let it grow and don't mow it. That lets the roots get down deeper and slows water down. If you, if you have vegetation or you're worried about planting vegetation and you still wanna see the lake, do something like add a view shed where you're kind of compromising. You're letting vegetation grow, but you're also able to enjoy those nice views of the lake and the bay. And if you have a lot of trees, you don't have to cut them down. You can sort of prune them up so you can still see through to the lake. So those are some sort of uh, practices you can, you can do to help vegetation work for you on reducing coastal hazards. So thinking about where your house is and how, how you're managing uh, business up by your house can go a long way in, in helping reduce erosion. Once we get to the slope, again, deep rooted and native vegetation is much better than a bare slope. Um, as we go down to the water, it slows runoff down, it holds the soil. And if you have an unstable slope, say a bank or a bluff, um, you, can, you can have it cut back to a stable angle if it's, if it's too steep. 
Um, if you don't have space for that, you can use retaining walls to help stabilize that slope. Um, that's if you have, you know, really steep and failing slope. Um, those are things you can do to help add some stability. Now, you've worked from the top, you've gone down to the slope, checked on water, where your house is, maybe you can't move it, um, and really none of these are going to help save your house. And then we start thinking about as sort of this last resort, looking at reducing wave impact and protecting the toe. And what, um, a lot of, the most common thing that, that's seen on the Great Lakes and I think around the bay is a revetment or riprap. So it's a structure that goes right along the shore. It's sloped back and it's made of an erosion resistant material. Oftentimes it's, it's rock. And so a revetment is more than rock dumped on the shoreline. And rock dumped on the shoreline certainly will resist some erosion, but I've heard plenty of stories just tonight about Lots of money spent on rock on the shoreline and then the, the storm comes up and takes it away. So what does say, a coastal engineer do to make sure the rock that's put on the shoreline stays in place? And so this cross section of a revetment will work through and, and what's in there and, and why is it like that? So we'll start by what the material is. So we see graded layers, not just rock, but we have on top is, is larger armor stone. That's large enough so that the waves don't move it around. Um, underneath that, if we just put that large stone directly on the shore, there's big gaps in between those big stones. And so when the waves come, hit them, soil goes out in between those big gaps. And so erosion will continue, those stones will start to sink down. Um, and so it's not really the most effective way to use those big stones. If we put in a filter layer of smaller stones, that can fill that gap and prevent that soil from being pulled out. Uh, it also gives a nice uh, stable surface for those large rocks to bed into, so they're not moving around as much as if you just put them directly on the ground. Um, filter cloth is also used oftentimes. Uh, that's a geosynthetic material that also helps some of that fine material stay uh, from coming out. And important to note, these methods, the filter layer and the filter cloth, allow water to move back and forth so you don't have water building up behind this was impermeable, impermeable to water, you'd have water pressure possibly building up behind it and punch, punching out and causing a failure. So um, these let water flow back and forth. So we, importance of different, different sized materials, adequately sized materials, uh, the filter cloth, and then the material is at a stable slope angle. And so that's denoted here by HV. So, generally advisable to have a two to one slope ratio. That means for every two feet of horizontal, it drops one foot. Uh, steeper than that, really hard to get a stable revetment, Re requires larger armor stone, and sometimes that, that just doesn't work. Um, so um, having an adequate slope, and then having the revetment extend high enough so that when waves, when the largest waves you expect to see or want to defend against, crash into your revetment, they don't go over the top and start undermining it from the back. Um, so having it to an adequate height. And then finally, as we get down into the water, reinforcing the toe. And this is important for, as the waves come in, they don't scour out uh, the bottom of the revetment or the revetment doesn't slide into the lake. So you're kind of locking the, the stone in place. And so, as I said, it's more than dumping rock on the shoreline. There's, there's some thought um, that goes into the design to really have these stones doing the best work that they can. And so now we're, now we're moving from cartoon view to engineer view. So what are some design considerations for, for a revetment? Well, big one is the size of your armor stone. Um, oftentimes when a revetment fails, uh, the stone was not sufficient enough size to withstand the waves that are coming in. So how would someone design a revetment to be big enough? Um, factors that are taken into account is the wave climate. The bigger the waves you're expecting to see, the, the heavier the stone has to be. Um, a lot of times in these shallow environments, um, the waves break as they come into your house. You know, you see a 10-foot wave out in Green Bay. A 10-foot wave's not hitting your house. The waves are breaking as they get into shallower water and expending energy. So a lot of times, you don't see the 10-foot wave. Um, your wave is depth limited 
it will break as it gets closer to the, to the shoreline. And so the largest waves you'll see are dependent on how deep the water is gonna be at the toe of your revetment. And so that factors in storm surge and water level as well, um, but that's often the, the deciding factor. Um, the other thing is the, the slope of your revetment. So the steeper the slope, the heavier the stone has to be to withstand the same wave energy. Ice impacts can throw a wrench into it too because we know ice, ice can move with a lot of force on the bay. I'm sure many of you can tell me many stories. Um, sometimes this is sort of a limiting factor in the design and you need to design your armor stone conservatively large to take into account ice effects. So what does all this mean? Well, site dependent on what size stone you may need versus what you may need. Um, but we're thinking of hundreds of pounds, if not tons, and how big these stones are. So when you're, when you're talking about getting a revetment done, we're thinking about asking these questions. Well, how did you come up with how big this stone is? And if you hear, you know, see something that you can go pick up, probably not gonna stay there very long. Um, we're, we're thinking of the most extreme conditions that we want these structures to survive. Um, another uh, piece of information about armor stone. Um, this, is a, this is a revetment in Milwaukee. It's been there for 20 years. The stone is angular. It's, it's fractured. That helps the stones interlock with each other. You don't want to see round, bouldery stones. That allows them to slip and slide. Thinking about stacking up marbles versus stacking up gravel. Okay, we want to stack up gravel and not marbles if we want to make something stable. Also, the, how the stone looks. There's, it's not really long and flat. It's, you know, um, the aspect ratio, so the, the length versus the height. You don't want it more than three to one, three times wider than it is tall because the stone itself may break, those slide around. Um, you want things that look like this. So um, that's, those are the sort of considerations when you're getting rock put on the shoreline, riprap, um, things to keep in mind and questions to ask. How did you come up with that stone size? Um, is it gonna be angular? And how much stone? Well, uh, generally advisable to have a two layer of armor stone. And why would we do this? You can kind of see in this nice engineering two hexagon revetment. Um, if you have a single layer of armor stone, if any one of those stone moves, now you've exposed the vulnerability, pull out material, everything can sort of unravel from there. When you have at least you know, two, uh, two layers of armor stone, that way you're much more resilient. One stone moves, uh, you've not exposed the smaller filter layer, um, and, and you're much less likely to see a, a failure with a two armor stone system. Then we're thinking about how high does this have to be and, and designing how high the crest has to be based on the wave conditions. When waves hit this, they'll run up and we don't want them to go over the top and start eroding the material behind. This little figure has something called a splash apron. Um, this would help take care of some of that overtopping. It's smaller stone placed on the top, but that can um, withstand some of the spray that comes over the top. Some of this, once it hits the revetment, there would be smaller waves coming over the top. So if you see splash apron, um, that's what that's doing. Our filter layer, and we want it to be smaller stone than the armor stone so that it can sort of let the armor stone nestle into it. General rule of thumb from the Army Corps of Engineers is that filter stone weighs about a tenth of your armor stone. And so it's gonna be smaller. It's gonna, it's gonna not um, sneak out through those gaps. Not so small that it sneaks out the gaps between the armor stones. And then finally, uh, the protection on the toe. This, this uh, drawing has a bit different of toe protection than the one I showed earlier. This one specifies a large piece of armor stone, larger than the armor layer, dug into a trench at the base, and that sort of locks in the revetment at the bottom. So um, again, making sure that toe protection is something that's considered when you're talking about getting this sort of work done. Now, there are some downsides to hardening the shoreline. One of the main ones is it's quite expensive, as many of you know. Uh, other impacts are you changing the nature of the shoreline. Um, so here's a little a visual story. Um, April 2007, 
uh, we, we notice this revetment go in, and then five years later, this is low water conditions. We had an erosion rate of one feet per year before that revetment went in, 10 feet per year after it went in. What's happening here? Well, as the waves come in, they reflect off that harder stone and make a, a, a larger wave energy environment out in front of it. And so that's causing more erosion, that's changing the near shore dynamics. Also might be blocking sand coming in uh, through, the, through the near shore drift as the waves erode, they move sand around. You put impediments in the way, you could block that. Well, April 2017, a lot of erosion going in, put in another revetment further down the line, four years later, 11 feet per year. So this, is, this can lead to sort of a propagation of effects if we're not thinking about what we're doing and changing the environment. Another, another point to note is, do you see a beach in front of the revetment during our almost record low water periods? No. So as waves reflect off the revetment, the waves come back, it creates a very high energy wave environment. It's really hard for sand to settle out and make a beach. So thinking about a trade-off when we put in a revetment, the likelihood of us having a beach again when we don't really need the revetment, when we're low water period, goes down. So again, we don't wanna just put in armor just you know, as reactionary. It's really, when I say, if necessary, as last resort, these are the sort of things that make me say that, besides the cost. So what can we do to mitigate these impacts? Well, one thing is, a lot of your neighbors are probably experiencing erosion. If you do this sort of piecemeal approach, you're putting those edge effects all over. If you all need to do shore protection, working together, getting one person to do it, uh, can be often cheaper, it's more efficient, access to the site only has to be done once, and you're mitigating these sort of edge effects if everyone goes in together. You still have effects at the end of the total structure. Sometimes you can tie that into an existing revetment, um, but working together is one way to kind of cooperate and not have these effects propagate here and there and uh, kind of starting a fight with your neighbor. Um, other types of shore protection that are uh, less common but want to talk about briefly, seawall, this is a vertical shore protection structure, uh, either concrete, sheet pile. Um, this acts like a revetment in that it sort of gets in the way of a wave hitting, hitting your erodible shoreline. Waves reflect more off of a vertical seawall than they do a revetment. So when we're talking about scour issues, um, they're, they're even uh, more so with a seawall. Breakwater, I haven't seen in Wisconsin too many residential uh, people put in breakwaters. These are structures that get put offshore. They're not directly protecting the shore, but they're, the waves hit them and then the resulting waves that do hit the shore are much smaller and much less capable of eroding the shoreline. Again, not too common um, for a property owner to do this, but I wanted to mention it just as, as something else that's out there. If you hear the term breakwater, this is really kind of a technical definition um, what a breakwater actually is. And then a little bit different, we're not protecting the shore with a groin, it's a, it's a structure that sticks out into the water. And why would you do that? Well, as the waves move sediment around along the shore, if you put, a, put something in to block it, you start catching that sediment, building up a beach. You catch the sediment on one end, you're not replacing it over here. So that can lead to immediate effects uh, on the other side of a groin. Not too common in the Green Bay area, the seen a lot more in the Kenosha area, um, but it is, a, it is a type of structure. Now in the high water level periods, as you build up a beach, uh, the high water can inundate that beach and groins seem to be a little less effective because what you're building up to protect your shore is getting inundated by the rising water. So um, looking around the coast, I see a lot of empty looking groins um, when we kind of really need the shore protection the most. So, Something that's out there, effects to consider, um, but those are kind of the main options in, ter in terms of protecting the shoreline. Now, what would be considered unsuitable shore protection? I see your cars. <laughs> Junk cars, yes. Junk cars. Uh, what did we see in the list, uh, Julia? Uh, shopping carts filled with rocks, um, you know, any, anything you sort of manage to, you know, imagine put out there, people have done in desperation. 
But some of the main ones that we see, concrete rubble with rebar in it, um, you know, our old road was not, that concrete was not designed to be taking forces of waves. That can bust apart real easy. And if there's steel rebar in it, um, it starts to get exposed, rusty, and then you've made your shoreline rusty metal. Uh, definitely not something you wanna be doing. Um, and the effectiveness, once those pieces start to break apart, they're much less effective against the waves. Does it offer some protection? Yeah, more than nothing. But is it what you want on your shoreline when the water levels go back down? Probably not. Poorly interlocked concrete block. I saw this, um, a lot of concrete blocks. Does it provide some protection? Sure, it's not stacked up. There's no crest elevation, so when we get a storm surge, waves go right over the top of it. There's a lot of voids in between those concrete blocks. There's no filter layer. So again, it's something, but it's really not the most effective thing. And for, what, for the money spent on that, probably not really getting a whole lot of bang. Um, Dumping material just over a slope. This is not really getting your graded layers well. Your armor stone's not getting in a two-layer system. Uh, it's just kind of landing where it lands. Um, does it provide some protection? Sure. Is it super effective? Not really. And by having a bunch of stuff land on your slope, you're adding extra weight and can make that slope less stable. And then finally, uh, big plate-like pieces of rubble like this. Um, are gonna get busted apart and they slide around. They really aren't super effective. And this is in Kenosha has since been performing quite poorly. Um, condition issues with shore protection. So shore protection is not a set it and forget it thing. The waves are doing work, they're moving things around. Um, they have to be monitored and maintained. Some things to look out for if you have shore protection is flanking around the edge of a revetment. The waves can kind of get around and behind and start eroding behind your revetment. Cracks in your armor stone. Uh, this is a fairly old piece of limestone that's split into three pieces. That weight is now a third and its ability to withstand wave forces much smaller. So looking out for cracked armor stone. Um, instability. So this, is, this was a revetment that became very steep and started to tumble over under the forces of waves. Um, and, a, and a big storm will take that out then. And then looking out for any gaps in a, in a structure. So here we have um, a gap in, in a revetment here. This side was well maintained on the right and on the left sort of left to go. It was built in the 70s and this picture was taken in 2012 when we had low water and now uh, that revetment is well in the water. Um, the well maintained section still there, still providing protection the, the piece that was sort of left to go is doing nothing right now. So maintenance of shore protection structures is needed for long-term function. So um, say you get something installed now, uh, you've got to be on that. You've got to get it inspected, get looked at after major storms that are causing damage because you want to make sure that uh, some small settlements, some movement of stone does not lead to a total failure of your structure in the future. So. Again, thinking from the top down, thinking about what you can do in your kitchen, what practices you can put in at the top of your slope, and if you need it, looking at shore protection structures. So real quickly, uh, there is a handout with, with resources for property owners that has been put together. Uh, it has links to living on the coast, links to um, fact sheets of more detail on slope stability, on shore protection structures, links to a list of known contractors and engineers. Um, this is, if you're gonna pick something up, take this in Living on the Coast Home um, and the other resources that are out there. I don't mean to diminish the other resources that are out there. Find it online if you wanna just click the links, do a web search for resources for Great Lakes Coastal Property Owners. You will find it on there. The note is on the handout of what to, what to search in your favorite web search. Um, but this will get point you to a bunch of other resources that can provide more information, including Living on the Coast, which um, gives a bit more detail about what I talked about, but um, essentially what I talked about, you can read it at home. So uh, I think at that point, I will uh, end and uh, turn it over to the DNR. All right, our last set of speakers is from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. We have Crystal Van Holt and Michelle Staff.
Good evening. I am Crystal Von Holt. I am with the Department of Natural Resources, a water management specialist. I cover five counties. Three of them are coastal, Marinette, Oconto, and Brown County. I am very happy to meet you. I would really appreciate if you could raise your hand if we've talked or worked together on a project. I'm really excited to meet a lot. Yay, look at all the people. And the ones that I've not talked with yet or worked together with, I look forward to working with you. My business card is on the table up front. Feel free to take it. Call me, email me. I get a lot of phone calls and a lot of emails, so I appreciate your patience. I return every phone call and every email. So if you have any questions, just let me know. I only have a couple slides that are gonna walk you through the website. I wanna give a little bit of uh, introduction into it so you know why we're talking about that. To kind of connect the dots from what you've heard, about high water level, how we got to where we are, uh, the impacts of flooding and how to prepare for flooding. Um, the one thing that Army Corps said that they don't address is erosion, and that's why I'm here. So with the DNR on the waterway team, we work with shoreline erosion control or shore stabilization, the rock, the armoring to protect your property. Most often projects are going to require a permit uh, the permit process can take about three to four months, which is why we have uh, what I'll go through, the emergency riprap option. So riprap is uh, a revetment. Riprap is a, a project, a design you can install on your shoreline to protect your property against the erosion. We have <clears throat> a streamlined process for an emergency authorization, which gets you the ability to install riprap right away, protect your property, and then we follow up with the permit process. So we'll work through the paperwork, get the application submitted, get a permit for your files, for our records, so that that structure, that riprap that you place, has a record for perpetuity. So it's a permanent structure to protect your property. The, um, I have, these are my FAQs. I've collected a lot of FAQs over the past year, so I wanna make sure I cover everything. Uh, the emergency riprap process is for coastal shorelines. Uh, the Great Lakes water body is considered a coastal water body, so the shoreline along the bay is a coastal shoreline. So I'm gonna probably refer to a lot of this as a coastal shoreline. That's where we have our emergency riprap option. Um, uh, emergency riprap is for when you are deciding, I need to do work now. Some people I've worked with, they are looking ahead, they're planning ahead. If they're planning to do work over winter or two to three months from now, it may just be something to consider of going through the permit process now. Getting that paperwork started, one process versus emergency riprap process, and then the permit process. So it's up to you what you decide. If you're looking to do an emergency project now, we have this option. If not, you can let me know and we can just start the paperwork for an application so that you can just get the permit, plan ahead, and then have your contractor ready to do work when your permit's in your hand. The emergency riprap authorization is a one-page form. We did print a bunch of hard copies of it. It's up front. Definitely grab one. You can fill it out. It's one side of one page. You can fill it out, scan it in, uh, make a PDF and email it to our inbox to file it. If you need to, you can drop it off with me. I help people scan it, make it into a PDF and email it for you. Otherwise, you can go online and fill it out yourself on the computer and click the submit button. And that's what I'm gonna lead you to. So we have at our homepage, if you go to the DNR homepage and you type in waterway or water permit, this, it'll lead you to our home, our home page for the waterway protection. So when you're on the home page for waterway protection, this is a Great Lakes water body, so any kind of shore protection, we are looking at the Great Lakes erosion control link. When you click on that link, it'll lead you to the Great Lakes home page. There will be a red box, and this is talking about your emergency riprap information. The blue link at the bottom will lead you directly to this form. We call it a self-certification form. That's because you read through it, the short list of requirements. Your signature at the bottom means that you are certifying your RIPRAP project is going to meet those requirements. 
So here's what the form looks like. Those orange brackets are indicating what requirements we have to make sure that the riprap is designed to meet those means you have a, an eligible project for the emergency riprap process. So I'm gonna bring those, bring those up so we can read them. Uh, we have some dimensional requirements. Two to one slope is what you've heard already. That's a stable slope. So we also are looking to make sure that you have a uh, riprap placed at a stable slope. So it's uh, there to protect your shoreline. It's not going to slump or fail. We have, <clears throat> We have a requirement to make sure you are on the Great Lakes shoreline. Um, rock riprap goes up to the top of the bank. A lot of the bank, like we heard, a lot of the banks around the bay are a lot lower compared to Lake Michigan where they have the higher bluffs. So we do have roughly five foot banks in a lot of areas. A rock protecting the bank face against erosion. Making sure when you work with your contractor or an engineer, whoever you are hiring for your project, making sure that they can help you design a project with large enough rock. That's key, that's key. Large rock is gonna stay in place. If it's too small, it's not going to do much for shore protection. Materials, blasted quarry stone, angular quarry stone. We do um, consider rounded field stone as riprap material as well. Again, the, the angular rock is going to interlock and stay as one contiguous structure. It's gonna protect your, your bank a lot better. <laughs> Excuse me. When you complete your form and you sign it, whether you send it to me or you can do this yourself on the computer, you're going to file the form by sending it to this email inbox. We've created this inbox strictly to receive those emergency riprap requests. DNR staff will review them, put them in our system and create a file so that we can go back and see who has gotten their emergency riprap filed. Once you file this, you can file it, let's say in the morning. If you have a contractor ready to go, they can start work that afternoon. This process allows you to file your request with that basic information and you can start work right away. You do not need to hear from us. You don't need to wait for anything. As long as you have filed your self-certification form, you can start the work. Once you have your emergency riprap constructed and you are ready, you can contact me. I can help you through the process. That's when you file your application. So then we go through the permit process to get that permanent record for your riprap. Here's a website that would take you to permit information. I usually don't bog people down during the emergency with permit details. Uh, it, it's roughly a three to four month process. There's a couple steps to it and I can walk you through those when we get to that point. You can look, go look at the information for the permit process. I think focusing on the emergency and making sure that you have what you need for filing the emergency riprap is, is the first step. We have a team of staff dedicated to helping staff like me respond to all the phone calls and emails. A lot of public uh, general questions. I do ask for their help. We have a, we call them a call intake team. They are, you can reach them with a Madison based phone number or an email address. They are aware of the emergency riprap process. They can help you out. I am here to help you out too. So feel free to call or email with any questions. I will talk to every one of you if you have questions for me. I will get to all of you. You can also use them. If you have something that isn't quite as urgent, this is a good option as well. And then here's my contact information. My business card is up front. Make sure you grab one. Um, let me make sure I covered all my FAQs. Oh, when you get to the point for filing a permit application, it is joint with Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, so when you file or submit your application for RIPRAP, once we're through the emergency, when you file it with the DNR, we send a copy of your whole permit application to the Army Corps. So you are applying to two agencies with one submittal. So it's joint, you get two for one. Um, I had a question the other day for engineers. 
coastal engineers are an excellent resource. They can really help make sure you have a successful project designed for your conditions at your site, at your shoreline. However, it is not a requirement that you have an engineer design your work. I have most of the applications I see are done by contractors or landowners designing their own projects. It's a very common. It's a very popular way for projects to be designed. We do encourage that you make sure that you have somebody who knows uh, the conditions that your shoreline is experiencing, who can help you size that rock properly, who can help place it properly. Um, but it's not a requirement to have a coastal engineer. I think that about covered it. I will be around for questions afterwards as well. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michelle Staff, as what was um, previously stated. I am actually the state and a, the National Flood Insurance Coordinator for the state of Wisconsin. I too work with the DNR, but my major role is a liaison between um, flood insurance, the National Flood Insurance Program and our state. So as what was stated earlier, um, we see a lot of cost of flooding. We're seeing a lot of cost of flooding right now. We are seeing this across the state. Um, as was kind of mentioned, um, this is a, a regional situation. We're seeing high groundwater, we're seeing a uh, river, a uh, lot of river flooding, and we're seeing um, the Great Lakes. So this is a statewide issue right now. One way to protect yourself, and the reason why I'm here is um, from a standpoint from the landowner, what they can protect themselves is with flood insurance. And a lot of times uh, flood, insur or flood insurance is the only way to protect your po property against flooding. Um, flood insurance or uh, flooding is not usually covered in your homeowner's insurance. And a lot of people don't understand that. They think their homeowner's insurance is going to cover them. It will not cover you for flooding. Uh, there is a FEMA flood insurance website. It's listed up there. They do have a 1-800 number too. If you notice, I'm gonna talk about it a little later, but you can get flood insurance at, in this, uh, I'm not advocating anyone, but in this one, it's farmers. Um, Allstate, uh, American Family. You can go to your local insurance agent and ask them about flood insurance and they'll give you quotes of all different, um, how, all different uh, coverages you have. As I stated, um, homeowners and renters do not cover flooding events or flood damage. Um, it will pay you regardless if uh, there's a natural disaster or uh, the federal government um, says this is a disaster, it will cover you. They, you do claims just like your auto insurance, just like homeowner's insurance. And as I said before, you can get it through your local agent or you can call FEMA directly and ask for a policy. Some facts, <clears throat> and it was mentioned earlier, you can get flood insurance outside of a high flood risk area. Um, actually, we see across this nation, 20% of all flood, of the claims are actually outside of that high risk area. This is actually from Madison um, from 2018. This is not in a floodplain. It's not a high risk area. This is urban flooding. Um, it will cover urban flooding also. Another fact is that over the lifetime of a 30 year mortgage in a high risk area, you have a 26% chance of being flood damage versus a 10% damage from a house fire. And we don't think twice about uh, fire insurance. So just uh, some statistics on that. Flood insurance can, can cover single family homes, two to two to four family homes, condominiums, other residential structures, renters. So you don't have to be a homeowner to get it. Um, and non-residential businesses and other outbuildings. 
how they rate your policy and how much you're going to pay in that policy is going to depend if you're in that high flood risk versus low flood risk and also how high your um, your house is or your structure is uh, there's a lot of words there i'm just going to be very brief um, for a uh, residential the maximum coverage is two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the structure they do cover content um, and that's up to $100,000. For a non-residential or a multifamily, it's up to $500,000. Um, and again, I have a, another 1-800 number and, and um, information of how you can get that uh, quotes. How, how much you cost is gonna depend on how much you're gonna cover and what you're going to cover. Um, I'm going to see if this video uh, works or not. Um, let's see if it's going to work. Over 2008, uh, we had a lot of flooding events, and FEMA did do uh, a. Oh, can you hear it? Eight inches deep would come up not only over the banks, but into the house, seven and a half feet high. It was just under the ceiling. The water was so violent. I'd say it came up one to two feet um, a minute. The refrigerator pushed a hole through the kitchen ceiling. Whatever was left was destroyed. And we ended up um, filling nine dumpsters, having the house gutted. No one in the area had any idea that it would ever flood the way it did. You know, I sit in a chair in the river and fish. I mean, I, I'd jump in there in the hot weather and you know, cool off. The house is about 120 to 130 feet from the Little Lacrosse River. So I'm not in the floodplain. I'm not required to have flood insurance, but I believe in flood insurance because I live near the water. Simple as that. FEMA's reaction was immediate. And within a day and a half, there was an insurance adjuster here and they went through everything. And within a week or two, we had to check for 20,000 and then the rest of the insurance, they think it totaled out to about 105,000. I couldn't have moved forward without it. We rebuilt the entire downstairs, kitchen, bathroom, everything, carpet, walls, insulation, wiring, did it all. My name is Marty Severson. I live outside of Sparta, Wisconsin. I am 70 years old and retired and disabled Vietnam vet. Flood insurance is the best investment I have ever made. I would have lost everything that I've been working for all these years, but having flood insurance saved my life. Just again, a local perspective of flood insurance. Um, it does take 30 days for that policy to take effect. So you can't wait until the water is at your doorstep um, because you won't, it, it takes 30 days. Uh, we, we heard about some mitigations. Uh, efforts. There's also mitigation effort um, on structures. You heard some of that about moving the house back. There are many ways to mitigate. Um, some of them can be very simple things if you do have a crawl space or a basement um, to actually move utilities up to the first floor or above or fill in that basement. Again, depending on your situation, there will be many ways to mitigate. What we talk about with mitigation is kind of, again, the long-term effect um, and trying to protect you not only from this event, but from future events. What we see, again, nationwide is every dollar spent on mitigation, you save and the community saves $7. And that was a recent study um, from 2018. Funding sources, we get a lot of questions about funding sources. Um, there are many, um, there is uh, grants and loans too. They can be from federal government, they can be from state government, and they can be local. And we also can work together and match grants from state um, to federal and federal to local. Um, we do, again, there is a resource guide for Wisconsin specifically on mitigation funding options, um, and it is at uh, the FEMA.gov uh, website, 
And if you're interested in any mitigation or you want to talk about mitigation, more than happy to answer any questions about that. And then one brief other thing I did want to mention while we're here, there are some um, local permitting um, people in the, in the room here. Please, if you do have flood damage or you are going to improve your structure, please go to your local community, your city, village, or county and ask about um, permitting requirements. Um, they are more than happy to help you. And actually, they are also have a great resource of mitigation options for you. And here's my contact information. We do have, I do have a general card out there, but if you do need to get a hold of me, that's my information. Thank you. All right. Well, I've, can we give our speakers a round of applause? <laughs> All right. We're going to take some questions now from the audience. Is Megan still here by any chance? Oh, she's way back there. Is this another microphone, Liz? Can you use this one and then yeah. I'll, I'm gonna. If you wanna just raise your hand, we're gonna bring a microphone to you. I don't know if that's actually the problem, but I'll just hear I. I just didn't want it to be feedback. All right. Megan, will you take the other mic and then do the other side of the room? Thanks. Thank you. Um, I've got basically two, two questions. The first one has to do with the flood insurance. Uh, the first one has to do with, with the flood insurance. And uh, is it necessary that you have, in order to collect, you have to have houses on each side of you um, also with flood damage? That's the first question. Okay. Is it on? Um, you have to, a flood is if you have at least two people affected by the flooding event. So they don't have to be adjacent to you and then you are in a house. Um, what we're seeing is not a problem with that. Hey, great, thank you. The, se the second question is kind of a local one. Um, I live on, on the, or adjacent to the Sensible Wildlife Preserve uh, on Sunset Beach Lane. And uh, we had a lot of problems with, with the winter storms and such. And so most of our, myself and most of our neighbors have uh, put in additional riprap and, and various um, ways of defending our shoreline from the bay. But what has happened is that the uh, when you get a seish or that sort of thing the water comes up the Swamico River and then it uh, goes across the road into the sense of a wildlife preserve and then it it fills up that area and then comes back across the road toward our houses and I'm wondering if anything can be done about that thank you That, that sounds like a doozy of a problem. Um, so could something be done? Probably. Would it be cost effective to sort of stop that water? It's hard to say. Um, you know, it sounds like the elevations are, are not working in your favor. So um, I don't have a definitive answer for you. It's, it's a somewhat of a unique situation, but I think, you know, Certainly flood insurance would be the first step to protecting yourself against that without having to rely on a large sort of public works project to sort of build a levy or, or something like that. So, or mitigating the house. Or mitigate, yes, mitigating the house. That, of course. The raising the elevation of the house would, uh, you know, would help mitigate that as well. So that would probably be the two things you can control is insurance and raising the house. Okay, I, I had a question for Crystal. Um, our property's got a uh, riprap that was put in 20 years ago and is still in pretty good shape, but the high, high flood uh, waters have washed right over top of it. So what we're looking for is probably not what you're talking about, the emergency project, 
because we've already got an authorized riprap. We're looking to repair and extend it against the higher water. And I've got a DNR form that uh, talks about that kind of emergency thing. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that, what it takes to go ahead? Uh, because it looks like you don't need a permit to extend or repair riprap if you've got a permitted riprap. Her, okay, I'm just gonna make sure we're on the same page. Permitted historically, you have a permit? From yes, yeah, like we, it was 80s. built with a permit 20 years ago. Okay. And it's solid, it looks good, but the water's so high it's washing logs over it. Very good question. If you have a permit from in the past, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, two years ago, uh, if you have a permit, you can repair, rebuild, maintain according to those permit conditions. Um, the, the dimensions that are important are how many linear feet of shoreline. So if you have a 50 foot frontage, then maintaining 50 feet. If you're looking to expand it to do 75 feet, that's where a new permit would come in. Um, if you have a dimension for a length or a toe, so if it goes out seven feet and you wanna make it 10 feet out, that's where we would talk about a new permit. Um, if you're maintaining what you have, 50 feet by six feet, if you need to upsize the rock, that's fine. That's good. If you're staying within that footprint and you have an old permit, go right ahead. Yep, if you're looking to change those, make it longer, then we can go through the emergency process to start the work right away and then follow up with a new permit just to capture the entire structure if you're making that change to it but you can go ahead thank you this is for adam um you mentioned concrete seawall or sheet pile seawall is that allowed i'm under the impression it's not maybe crystal can more definitively answer that question i'll stay up here <laughs> Seawall, sheet piling, uh, the emergency process is for a riprap design, so rock at a two to one slope. If you are looking to do stacked, something with a vertical face, stacked rock, sheet piling, uh, wooden seawall, seawall designs are not covered by an emergency riprap process. So you will need to go through a permit process for that. If you have an existing, so I have a lot of people I've worked with over the past 12 months who have an existing seawall, they have opted, most of them have opted to do emergency riprap immediately in front of their wall to add some bulk, add the, the slope, which is good for wave and energy attenuation and, and ice to run up it. So it, it has, riprap design has fewer negative impacts than what a seawall does. So if you strictly have a seawall, an option would be if you wanna rebuild a seawall, if you want that design, we will talk about the permit process. The emergency riprap option doesn't work for seawalls. Um, otherwise, you can add this, the riprap in front of your seawall shoreline. But is the new seawall allowed? Projects like that are evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. <laughs> we, I have issued sea, I've issued seawall permits. Um, it, it really depends on what your site conditions are and, and what's on that shoreline for development. Hi, uh, back here, <laughs> Margaret Boshek. My question is actually for Dee. Um, I have a number of people asking me about the cyclic nature of the highs and lows of the Great Lakes. And we see that happening over like a 20 year period or so. Um, and we're at that peak now, but a few people are concerned with the precipitation that we're getting over the past few years, whether this is signifying a new norm and that we're going to continually see the lakes go higher and higher over the coming years. And it, so my question for you is in your professional opinion, is this a new norm or should we expect to see the water levels go back down in the next few years? Um, that's a great question. Um, so as you know, one of the things I talked about was that period of low water that we experienced from the late 90s to 
the 2013 and, and during that time people asked the same question then is that is that the new normal is that low water you know with you know as a result of you know maybe climate change is this the new normal um so you know right now from where we're sitting you know our forecasts really only go out six months and uh, even that outlook product that i showed is is really a you know just a scenario based tool and um you know the we saw from 2013 to 2015 a large change over a very short period of time. Um, so, you know, moving forward, we can't really definitively say if this is a new normal. Really, if we continue to see wet patterns, then likely yes, but there isn't anything to say that, you know, maybe in two to three years, we could even see that range be back near low water. So it's just, it's just very hard to, hard to say. This is a question for Crystal Walker. She, she le, uh, le, gave us a list of counties that will uh, receive support from the core. Uh, all, all the counties are nearby, uh, including uh, Brown, but she eliminated or didn't, didn't mention Door. I wonder why. So that list is what uh, it are the counties that are currently approved, gone through the formal approval process to receive technical assistance. We've been doing um, extensive outreach with a lot of the other counties. Um, so at this time, they are either not at the stage that they've requested technical assistance, or they're not experiencing problems, mostly erosion, that don't qualify for technical assistance. So uh, Door County, we're actively speaking with the emergency manager. We have the public meeting in Door County tomorrow. So um, I'm not sure if we'll go through that formal process, but we are partnered with them and speaking with them. So, and that goes for a lot of other counties. Um, we've been doing meetings in Milwaukee. Um, we speak, spoken with Kenosha. So, uh, so yeah, that is, that is the counties that have currently been approved for assistance. I'm not sure who would answer this question, um, but any of you are welcome to. Um, what could be done to either prevent ice shoves or to mitigate damage from ice shoves? And does flood insurance cover ice shoves before they melt? Flood insurance does not cover ice shoves. Is there, Adam, is there somebody else who could address potentially mitigating or preventing ice shoves from damage? Um, sort of stopping the ice shove is you know from from happening is tough you know it's it's a big piece of ice being moved by a, a large wind um so yeah so taking taking into account ice forces when say designing a revetment um that can that can upsize the rock basically uh to maybe match the thickness of the ice you're expecting so um yeah, so it takes a lot of rock and, and having it maybe properly sloped with ice conditions. So, so it's a, maybe a special consideration, particularly in Green Bay, because it's a lot of ice getting pushed by a lot of wind in a shallow basin. So, um, yeah, so it can be factored in whether, you know, how big the ice shove will be, you know, that, that's a little harder to, harder to know is still, um, but. A question about uh, disaster relief. Is there anything going on right now relative to federal loans and that type of thing, such that people who can't afford a new seawall have some way to mitigate their erosion? I think I'll be okay going this direction. Um, I'll be honest with you is that I deal with mostly structure type um, situations and not seawall type situations or not, you know, a structure type of situation. I guess I would um, probably recommend you talk to your emergency manager. They may have resources for you on that. Um, I'm sorry, I, I don't know. That's my question. Um. Yeah, as far as I know, there's no like federal disaster declaration um, on the Great Lakes at all for, for that. So um, I know in the state of New York, Lake Ontario, uh, 
2017 and, and this year, extensive flooding and damage. The, the state itself used state revenue to provide a relief program for property owners. Um, 300, it started with $50 million, then it was $300 million. And that was the state legislature in New York acting, um, no federal dollars in there. So it takes, takes a lot of uh, you know, momentum to try and get something like that. So as far as I'm concerned, or no right now, I don't, I don't know of anything in Wisconsin that would help out that way. Oh, that's when I should have let Lori jump in and, and say. Hi, I'm Lori Mackey with Brown County Emergency Management. I'm the new director as of January 1st of this year. So we do not currently have any type of declarations. Declarations are all after the incident. And where the problem comes in is that it's all based on thresholds of damage. So FEMA is the National Emergency Management. And then WEM, Wisconsin Emergency Management. Then your county emergency management and your local municipalities. So they set a rate every year that's the threshold rate. So you go out after an incident, assess damages, and based on the population, you see if you met the threshold or not, and then it has to go all the way from the local level all the way up. So the perfect example is the city of Green Bay has approximately 100,000 people. We'll just go with that for the ease of math. And the threshold is just under $4. So the city of Green Bay, would have to hit $400,000 worth of damage. And then there are caveats to that as well. FEMA does not accept any insured damages, any roads, bridges, anything like that that receives any amount of federal funding. You can't count that. So very quickly, with the type of things that we have in Brown County, you realize that you end up not hitting that threshold. And it has to hit the threshold at the local municipal level, then it has to hit the threshold at the county, which we have 250,000 plus people in Brown County. And then it would have to hit the threshold at the state as well to ever get to a presidential declaration. So in Wisconsin, one great thing we do have is called the Wisconsin Disaster Fund. It's not an ever flowing pot of money. The Wisconsin Disaster Fund basically tries to make it easier on a local municipality to cut out those loops in between. So the perfect example is the village of Wrightstown got hit with basically tornadic winds is what we called it this summer. Um, they tracked all their damages, put in a lot of extra hours, keeping track of all those expenses. Their village only has 3,300 people. So they hit the threshold. At the county level, no one else was affected from that storm event. So as far as receiving federal aid, it would die immediately there. Since Wrightstown hit that threshold, they could apply as a municipality to the Wisconsin Disaster Fund from the state. And like I said, it's not an ever flowing pot of money. When it's there, it's there. When it's not, it's not. So an event that costs approximately $50,000 for them in a community the size of 3,300 people, $50,000, you don't have that sitting aside for a rainy day. So they ended up recouping almost 70% of that as a municipality. On an individual level, individual assistance isn't offered by FEMA until you get to that presidential declaration. And we at County Emergency Management, your local municipalities, we would love to be able to just hand out money. The reality is there isn't any, and FEMA changes those stipulations because the FEMA doesn't have as much money, so it's harder and harder to meet those thresholds to get to that level where we can even think about applying for that kind of stuff. Thank you. Uh, I have a question, a couple questions for the DNR. Uh, first of all, um, does the DNR regulate everything, say, for Door County, Brown County, or O'Connell County, on what you can do on your shoreline? And then, uh, then I need assistance on how do you deal with, is this on? Mm -hmm. How do you deal with, uh, say, um, a neighbor that doesn't take care of his property? And, and it's costing me every, every day uh, lots of money 
to maintain my area and he's not doing anything and it's washing out on his, washing out into mine. I had to replace uh, about 70 feet of my, behind my seawall, which is concrete, when his eroded 30 feet deep into his property and sucked everything out on mine, see? So uh, is there any assistance from the DNR to say, send a letter? <laughs> I can answer those questions. <laughs> um, we, so at the state, we have, um, I'm gonna get a little bit technical and then I'll explain. We have our state regulations for navigable water bodies. Uh, we refer to it as chapter 30. It's literally a chapter in our book of statutes. So chapter 30, uh, you may hear me say, oh, you need a chapter 30 permit, a waterway permit. So chapter 30 is our set of waterway regulations, rivers, lakes, streams, for shoreline work. So if someone is proposing some kind of construction or project in or near a navigable water body, then the activity may be regulated. That doesn't mean that every project needs a permit in your hand. We have a tiered permit system. So a very low level project with low impacts um, we have exemptions. If a project meets all of the requirements or all the standards, the checklist for an exemption, that means you can do your work. It has to comply. It has to meet those design requirements, but you're exempt. You don't need the permit. If a project is not exempt, then there are a couple permit options, a general permit type, an individual permit type. So those are projects where you need that permit in your hand. For coastal shorelines, there are some exemptions. There are a lot of shoreline areas where you do need a permit, a chapter 30 permit. Brown County, the exemption, I'll jump back. The exemption is uh, an option where there is no designation for this water body. We look at ASNARI, A-S-N-R-I, Area of Special Natural Resource Interest. That designation is what tells me where an, el uh, an exemption is an eligible option. The coast of Brown County, starting from Marinette at the state line, all the way down the west shore, up the east shore of the bay, up to Door County, around the Lake Michigan side, and down to Kiwani, um, is all designated, which means the exemption is not an option. So shoreline protection, whether it's seawalls, riprap, um, boat ramps, dredging, those all require permits because there is not an, an exemption option. Next question. Uh, we at the state do not have the authority to require people do work on their shoreline. It is, it's a choice that a landowner makes. So if they're not maintaining it according to someone's liking, I hope that neighbors can talk and understand what they're doing or not doing may impact others. As long as they're not doing something against the regulations, I don't have the authority to get involved. If what they're doing is something where they need a permit and they did not get a permit, or they got a permit and then they're constructing something different, then I can get involved and kind of straighten things out. That is an option. The other option too is talking with a contractor and engineer to figure out what you can do on your property to protect against those side impacts. And I'm being told to wrap up. So please take my business card if you have other questions. I would definitely be happy to. So, so, so I have one more question. Uh, somebody said get a lawyer. The guy next door to me is a lawyer. <laughs> I can't win. For a few, do you want to? Do people want to take a few more questions? I know there's I, I a got lot of people. question. Wait, I know. Hold on okay. one second. I'm just oh. going to confirm because we're reaching eight o'clock, so that was our lot of time. Um, it depends on our speakers if you want to stick around for a few more minutes or. It's up to you, Adam. You're in charge. Yeah, maybe three, three more questions. And three more questions. Okay. Bill. I got a question for the Army Corps. 
Um, if we compare our water level today to 12 months ago, we've gone up 17 inches. Since 2012, we've gone up five feet. So we've been continuing to increase for some time. I was wondering if the Army Corps can explain to us the reasons why they can't be discharging more water out of Lake Michigan than what they're currently discharging. So, so out of Lake Michigan, there are two uh, places where water leaves. One is through the Chicago Diversion, which is a very small amount of water that is it was decided upon by a Supreme Court decree. So it's really um, not a whole lot that can be done there. The other outflow out of Lake Michigan Huron is, is in through the St. Clair River, which is um, an unregulated outflow. When we have higher water levels, the flows in between all of the lakes are very high, uh, just the nature of the system. So even this over this past year, we've seen flows well above average and at records depending on the given uh, outflow through a given river, so. Thank you. Um, there is one online question I, I wanted to address really quickly and it was, um, does flood insurance cover uh, damages due to erosion? No. <laughs> um, and why I'm saying this is if you are, is it, okay, better. Oh, the no. Um, it is a no, uh, but with that all being said, you do, it's, I, I try to explain this, it's like your auto insurance, it's like your homeowner's insurance. Talk to your agent, see what is covered, what is not covered, this situation, that situation, um, how much should I get coverage? Uh, it is a very distinct um, product and it has uh, exceptions like any other product. Uh, but please talk to your agent about that if you have special, very specific concerns. Thank you. Uh, Chuck. You are a question for um, Crystal. Um, many of us uh, have cottages or houses on the Bay Shore and we are uh, in flood zone. So if you, have, if you have a riprap shoreline and you have erosion of your property behind that, does the state consider ever uh, giving permits for fill? Oh, um, yes. And you may not need a permit from the state for filling back eroded property. Um, it's very similar to a lot. It's a case by case. So I've had people contact me with sinkholes that they've had um, pop up in their yards behind the riprap. And we've worked through a couple photographs to see, yep, you can fill it up, nothing needed. So case by case, but yes, it's very possible. That's where you would need to check with your local zoning, see okay. what they would require. Um, sorry, I think I took your thunder. That's okay, that's what I was <laughs> gonna talk about. Uh, floodplain and flood zoning and shoreland zoning are all done by the local level. So any permits um, behind that would be at, with your local zoning administrator or building inspection. Okay, and we're gonna take one last question. There was a woman over here who had her hand raised for a long time. I'm in the process of a permit out. Just wondering from the Army Corps of Engineers, do I expect, will I hear back from you? I've heard back from Crystal immediately and she's wonderful. Um, but just wondering if I should um, expect anything or only if needed. Squat down a little bit. So I, ha I have some bad news there. We aren't actually the people who do that permit. Um, so the permitting for the court is done with a joint permit process. So Crystal probably knows more about that. But the St. Paul District of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is what handles permitting for the state of Wisconsin. My understanding is that has to do because it's state by state regulations and laws. So that's not our Detroit office. So Crystal will be your point of contact there. Let let me know. Uh, Army Corps will. You will hear from them. Their time frames are different than the state, so I can never quite predict when you'll hear. Sometimes it's before the state, sometimes it's after. If you can send me an email, Jackie, I'll let you know who your uh, project manager is from Army Corps. All right, great. Okay, we're gonna wrap up. 
uh, right now. I just want to mention that there's the resources out there. There's a sheet out there that has all the different resources available. I would highly recommend picking that up. There's some fact sheets about working with contractors, shoreline structures, um, and things like that. So keep those in mind. And then also check out Brown County Code Red if you want to sign up for emergency alert system through text. Thank you. And just a big thank you to all our speakers, to Brown County, to Liz running the web stream, everyone who's pitched in and helped uh, put on this event. Um, thank you from me and, and, and the crowd. And thank you all for coming and listening attentively.